Yeah, we may have um, talked about your home because you were kind of going through. Oh that. yeah, that's probably what it was. About your home last time. Thank you, Connie. Connie says, can't wait to hear what I have to say. He delivers every time. Yes, I do, Connie. I'm going to deliver today, too. <laughs> so I kind of gave a preview. We're going to talk about mold and Lyme and detox and homes. Yes. Um, and we're well, well, happy to take questions. Let me just go share this event and we can get a little sneak peek of everything. Sounds good. Hello, Kimberly. Yes, I have some insights for you. I hope to be helpful. If you all have questions, please ask. All right, yeah, so here's the DIY Detox here's Summit. Here's the talks you get right away. There's three talks, and you get a bunch of bonuses, like five ebooks. Um, these are a couple of our, our – well, Peter Kahn is new this year. Um, Karen Christian has a immune talk this year. There's Evan. We'll, we'll, we'll learn from Evan. Yeah, I think we talked a lot about the home environment oh, yeah. with you last year. So we can maybe touch upon that again and like what you've learned since. But I'd love to hear about your health journey. Um, you know, you've been through a lot in the last, you know, few years for sure. Feels like 30 years, but yeah, it's been like three. <laughs> oh, I know, right? It's like, it takes, it'll eventually becomes like a memory, which is so amazing you know people are often are like am i ever going to get better and you know i'm happy to tell people that um you can get better yep so it can take a while so i'm honest about that part yes <laughs> it can take a while um so yeah here again guys uh, it's all the stuff we have a new talk on sauna this year which is always people have a lot of questions about buying saunas and stuff like that yeah and it's free coming up what there we go february 8th so next week yeah Pretty quick. Okay. Yeah, coming up February 8th. We've got some stuff on mitochondria. Jody is new talking about parasympathetic and she's so brilliant. Do you, you know Jody? Evan? I do know Jody. She's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. And she's super smart too. She so is. talks about like moving the gallbladder and kind of like detox order. So it's really yes. great. So it looks like they can put questions in the chat and there's actually like a dedicated Zoom Q&A here. So Connie put in a question, which is, do you always have to use a binder when getting in a sauna? I just got mine last week, but haven't used it yet. Do you want me to just go into that now yeah, and riff go on ahead. it? Yeah, ahead. Sure. Okay, Connie. So no, you do not always have to use a binder when getting in a sauna. However, it depends on your sensitivity. And if you're someone who you feel worse after a sauna session, then yeah, you probably should use a binder, possibly take one before or take one right after just to make sure you don't have any kind of Herx reaction. Now, it is possible to do too much binder. So one time I was doing eight capsules a day of charcoal and I actually herxed from that because I was actually mobilizing or excreting so much toxin. People, I think really mistake binders and they, they think it sounds very sexy and that it's binding to the toxin and then it's perfectly going to be excreted out through the organs of elimination via stool or via urine with the help of the kidneys. But in reality, binders are very weak, meaning that when you're using something like charcoal, you're going to be binding on to the different types of toxins, but it can easily fall off of that charcoal and get reabsorbed back into the intestinal tract. So this is why you have some clients or patients that feel worse, even just by doing binders. In theory, they would just feel better because you're just removing toxic substances from the system. But in reality, what'll happen is when you get that reabsorption, you can feel worse. So can you recommend a good binder for you to get? Yeah. So, um, uh, the one that I often use is called GI Detox from Biobotanical Research. That's a good product. The price is good. Um, also, I have one on my site. Uh, it's not public, but you, you technically could order it through me if you needed help getting it, which is from Beyond Balance. It's called Toxies Bind. I really love that one because it has some fulvic acid in it as well, like the GI Detox, but it's got a little bit of organic flaxseed oil powder, and that helps people move their bowels because the problem with binders, sometimes people get constipated. Usually you can counteract that by using a couple of grams of vitamin C or we'd like a product from Designs for Health called Colon RX, which is a blend of magnesium mm -hmm. hydroxide and triphala. That's a really good blend or triphala, however you want to pronounce it. We do like that, uh, but but the Toxies Bind is great too. So GI Detox, Toxies Bind, I also use a product a lot called NDF Plus which is a micronized chlorella that actually gets across the blood brain barrier and will actually get heavy metals out. That's actually what it's marketed and sold as is a heavy metal detox, but we often use it off label for mold. And we use that in children quite a bit too, because it's liquid. So micronized chlorella, 
GI, Toxies, those are going to be your top three binders. Yeah, and I agree, you know, some, some detox protocols are two GI detox three times a day on an empty stomach. It, it's quite a bit. I don't think I personally ever taken that much. And so I don't usually, you know, recommend that high unless I see a client really think, you know, I think I, they need it. I usually do more like two at bedtime with the client or, you know, I kind of call, say two with a sauna if you're like trying to do a souped up sauna. Like I have a sauna. I don't do binders every time at all. Um, but I don't really react to sauna. I don't really react to binders. A lot of people do get constipated from them. We sell this product from a cell tour called bowel mover. People are crazy about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I do sell, I do sell quite a bit of the bowel mover. The, the only thing I don't like about it is that it does have herbs in it, which do have some killing properties. I believe there's some clove in there and such. So, I mean, if we're doing like a killing protocol, I think it's a great strategy, but if we're just trying to heal the gut, I really want to try to move the bowels in another way. Connie asked, is that binder on your website? Yeah, the GI Detox is on my website. The Toxies, that company doesn't allow us to publicly put it on the site. Uh, but if you just contact my office, we could get the Toxies if you wanted to try it. It's pretty good, pretty good in terms of price too. And one to two caps twice a day, empty stomach is what I use. I'm actually inventing a binder that is similar, like moves the bowels and binds at the same time. So is this your, the is this your, there. is this like your, the thing you and I were talking about the other day? Yeah, this is not going to be our first product on the market. Our first is an electrolyte, which you can also use when you're saunaing or detoxing. But yeah, I've just kind of seen the need to pair a binder with something that moves the bowels. So, yeah. you know, and sometimes just keeping the bowels moving, keeping the gallbladder pumping is in a way could be more effective even than the binder just to keep things moving. So like you said, the binders aren't perfect. I don't want to downplay them. They're not effective, but it's not like it's under lock and key, like you said, as it's moving through your system. So I, yeah, I remember you had some detox reactions to that. Yeah. And yeah. That. Well, well, Bridget, I feel bad if I had 10,000 followers on Instagram, I could do the swipe up feature and then I could go on Instagram and say, Hey, everybody join us on zoom. But it's like hard to get people to click through on like an Instagram story. If you don't have the swipe up feature. Oh yeah, we just got that actually, but we haven't been doing that for the, <laughs> it's taught, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to inter interrupt us, but no, it's, it's all good. We put this on YouTube too, so we'll get some okay, great. traction. So let's, let's talk about your story a little bit. I know originally, you know, you started health coaching quite young from your own issues with digestion, anxiety, but then more recently you had quite the... <laughs> quite the journey with mold and then finding out some other things. Can you share that in case people don't know it? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, really, I started out just trying to use food as medicine. I got a uh, nutritional therapy practitioner credential. And so those letters after my name it taught me to use food as medicine for people. And I got rid of gluten, I got rid of dairy, I kind of pushed people more towards a paleo template or autoimmune template in some cases. And we got a ton of people significantly better, but not fully better. So you'd get like maybe 50 to 80% improvement, depending on what was going on with people. And then you'd hit a stone wall. And so I got frustrated. And I'm a guy who figures stuff out. I'm a get or done type guy. And so I just knew inherently there must be some other root causes here. This was before root cause medicine or functional medicine was really even like a common term. I still think it's a very uncommon term, but it, luckily it's becoming more commonplace. But at least back then I thought, well, I know that the conventional doctors want me to do acid blockers for my IBS. They wanted me to do antispasmatic drugs because I was having diarrhea. I was having constipation kind of back and forth. And basically what was happening is I had gut infections. I had parasites, crypto and giardia. I had H. pylori. Uh, I had candida issues. And so I really just chipped away at these things using the proper testing and then coming up with different herbal protocols on my own. I was able to address a lot of these infections and get my gut back to normal, but I was still anxious. I was still depressed and I still didn't sleep very well. And so, you know, we had moved house several times. I love being outdoors. I had had countless tick bites throughout my life. As long as I could remember, I had many cats and I've been scratched by my cats. I'd always love to tickle their bellies and kind of play with my cats. And then they would scratch me. And most cats have Bartonella. And mm. uh, I ended up testing positive for Bartonella. And Bartonella is something that can cause out of the blue anxiety or panic attacks. It can cause issues with your uh, depression. It can cause all sorts. I mean, there's like 50 different symptoms of Bartonella. And so I tested positive for that. And so 
Uh, also, mosquitoes can transmit it. Lice, fleas, and ticks can all transmit Bartonella. And uh, of course, with ticks, you can get exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacteria or the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. And so the testing for Lyme is not very good. So I showed up indeterminate for Lyme. But when I take herbs that, that treat Lyme, I have a reaction to it. So I would assume that I am dealing with Lyme because it's very rare to get tick bites and get co-infections like Bartonella and Babesia without having Borrelia. So if someone says I have Lyme, the chances of them just having Lyme, meaning Borrelia, are extremely slim. In the vast majority of cases, they're going to have Bartonella and Babesia and possibly mycoplasma, especially if there's joint pain involved as well. So I dealt with all that. My wife had mycoplasma. It was so bad that I remember her basically crying one morning because she couldn't even put on her wristwatch. She wanted to put on a watch and it hurt so bad to try to manipulate the jewelry that she was in such severe pain. And so we ran a blood test on her and confirmed that she had a very, very big mycoplasma pneumonia problem. And so we used herbs to address that. And luckily she was able to beat the mycoplasma. So, I mean, we really got into this thing with our own suffering. And then of course, you know, dealing with clients, I started realizing that I didn't get the easy clients anymore. And I know you saw this too in your practice, Bridget, is once you find out about this stuff, your clients start coming out of the woodwork. It's like, oh my God, where are all these moldy Lyme people coming from? But as soon as I started talking about it and addressing it in myself, here comes 50 clients who all got exposed to mold. And so I got really, really catapulted into this whole world. And now uh, Great Plains Lab, who we run a lot of organic acids and mycotoxin profiles, they just had me as a, an expert speaker. And I did the Q&A for it a couple of days ago. But now I'm like the headline speaker at Great Plains. And just a few years ago, I knew nothing about mold. It's like, oh my God. I said, why did you guys pick me? This is crazy. And essentially the answer was I'm running more mold tests than any practitioner in the US right now, probably in the world. And so I have firsthand experience of seeing what happens to people when you get rid of mold toxin. Number one, you can beat Lyme disease. Because here's the thing, people hear about this idea of chronic Lyme. And I think I've probably had it since I was a kid because I would go camping, I'd go stay at a cabin, I'd go out to the lake and you would just pull ticks off of you. That was just like a thing. And nobody thought anything about it. But now what I'm finding is all these quote chronic Lyme sufferers, really they have mold toxicity. And if you can treat the mold, you remove the toxins that are weakening your immune system. In particular, mm -hmm. there's one called mycophenolic acid. It's such a potent immune suppressant that they actually use it to prevent the organ transplant from being rejected. So if you're going to go get a new liver or some new organ, they'll give you this mold toxin to kill your immune system. So you don't wow. reject the new organ. That is crazy. And so I think this is the smoking gun. I think this is the missing piece for why people cannot beat their chronic illnesses is because of mold toxin chronically suppressing the immune system. And that goes hand in hand with chronic fatigue syndrome. I want to say his name was Dr. Brewer, but there was a study done on chronic fatigue. There was a clinic this doctor had, and he tested all of his patients for mycotoxins. And he found that 96% of all of his patients with chronic fatigue had at least one mycotoxin. And just to restate, that is from you living, breathing, or working in a water damaged building, a school, an office, a car, Mercedes recalled two and a half million cars for moldy HVAC systems. So oh. <laughs> if you feel fine now and you drive to Whole Foods and you have a headache by the time you get there, consider it to be mold in your car. That's another thing we test for. Yeah, you can test the car. That's interesting. You're one of the top um, runners <laughs> of mold tests at Great Plains. That's the same lab we use. I do like the looks of that vibrant test when I, some clients come with it too. I don't know all the differences and stuff. Uh, you and I talked earlier that I got a question recently about the pros and cons of taking glyphosate or glyphosate. <laughs> glutathione. Don't take that. Don't take a bottle of glyphosate before your test. Um, a glutathione before testing because it is a kind of a debated issue. So um, I've been, since we talked, I've been kind of looking into it a little more, but have you talked to Great Plains directly about that issue? I haven't talked to him directly, but I've been kind of hearing through the grapevine and seeing the way that our test results work. We have some children who they just can't do glutathione, even if it's liposomal, maybe it tastes too bad. Or if we had an oral version, they couldn't swallow it. Or we had an adult who, you know, they're so sensitive or so sick, we're really afraid to put them on glutathione. 
And what Bridget's talking about is really the idea of provoking the body, meaning that you're really sort of priming or squeezing the orange, if you will, to get extra juice or extra toxins out so that you can create a more accurate um, test result when we're testing someone's urine for mold. And there's a debate about whether you need to provoke the body or not. Similar to what you do for heavy metal testing, a lot of times people will do a chelator or possibly a natural chelator like chlorella, which you can use as a provocation agent to then test your stool or whatever for heavy metals. So the idea is to push the body so that you can see more. And I don't think it's mandatory. I have done it both ways. The vast majority of cases, we do try to get people to do provocation. Uh, but in some cases, we don't. In some cases, we just have people just do the urine test. And it really doesn't matter, to be honest with you. As long as we can get a positive test result of mycotoxins, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use binders and other things to help address them. So this is a test. I don't have the true test kit, but this is like you can, I haven't used the same company. You can run just for mycotoxins or you can do organic acids or uh, chemicals, including glyphosate, which is probably why it came to mind. Um, so yeah, it, you know, we have different people do different things too. Some people do sauna, some people do nothing. Some people do, I don't think we have many people doing fasting yet, which is just something that the lab, um, feels more comfortable with. Well, you're already fasted in the morning, right? I mean, if you eat dinner at 6 p.m. and then you wake up and you're collecting your first morning's urine at 8 a.m., right? That's already 14 hour fast. So in, in that way, you, you already are excreting more mycotoxins from that first morning's urine sample. So that's why I really don't care if somebody does it or not, because all we're really looking for is just the tip of the iceberg. So I've actually got a, uh, I've got an unprovoked, let me just show you this real quick. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you permission in case you don't have it. This doesn't have any names or anything on it, but I've got an unprovoked uh, yeah. test here. Let me know if you can see this, Bridget. Oh, yeah. So this is, a, this is an unprovoked mycotoxin screen. This was a gentleman in his 60s who had chronic fatigue. And we can see here that he had elevated levels of ochratoxin, which is probably the most common mycotoxin we're going to see. This comes from aspergillus which is going to be found in water damaged buildings. I don't think anything else showed up. Uh, a little bit of citrin in here, which comes from multiple molds. But I mean, here's the deal. All we're looking for is a positive test for several reasons. Number one, compliance from the client or the patient to make sure that they're going to do the detox they need to do to get this crap out of their system, right? So if, as long as we have compliance, then we're good. And all that we really need to see here is the tip of the iceberg. So it shows that he's a 15 here, which is toxic, but it's very possible that after two to three months or six months, when we go to retest him, we very well could see those mycotoxin levels go up significantly. They could go up dozens, they could go up hundreds of points. And if those mycotoxin levels go up, but he feels better, we assume that he's not getting exposed to new mold, but we assume he's getting better at excreting the toxins and that's why he feels better. So really it's just a, it's a tracking piece. It's a compliant piece, but you know, all that we care is that you get the test done. And if you see a little bit of a smoking gun, then that's enough evidence to make a protocol. Yeah. I think I've heard from a couple of practitioners in our space that even if it's just a teeny tiny bit in the, the range, they consider that a positive. I still tell people, you know, because people reading this for the first time, they might see, you know, a 15 sounds really high. It is high. You could definitely be sick. But then, you know, you're also going to see people with like a 200. So I like to tell people there are different ranges. And like you said, they, they things are going to change and they may go up and down uh, as you detox. Um, I wonder how often you feel you see a false negative or you think, you know, the writing's on the wall, but we don't see anything here. Yeah, good question. I mean, I rarely see negative, so I don't know. But in truth... A lot of times because of a history of amalgam fillings or other issues that we find with people, we're just going to give them a binder anyway, right? It's not going right. to hurt if we give them a little bit of charcoal, a little bit of clay, or maybe a little bit of chlorella. So, I mean, even, or if there's a budget issue and someone can't get the mycotoxin screen done, we could just use a binder in general, just as an insurance protocol while we're working on the gut infections or whatever other issues going on. Yeah, it's usually several things at once. And, and really, you know, I think with detox, 
you can cover a lot of bases, even if you don't really know what it is, you know, like that Envirotox test I just showed, it's, it's not cheap. Um, and you know, a lot of stuff you can do really safely on your own, even if like, if, even if you perks a bit, you can always cut back. So you can do sauna on your own, Epsom salt baths. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do, green drinks that detoxify the body of whatever's in there, you know, help support the body. Uh, it's kind of nice to know sometimes what you have so you can like chip away at it and track it, like you said, but uh, it's not always required. Yeah, I usually see positives too. So I was surprised that this client, um, you know, had a negative and then later when she moved, she had high positive. So I kind of speculate, um, it was just, you know, she just wasn't pushing anything out, but I'm gonna talk to the lab more about the glutathione issue and pros and cons, but yeah, I agree. I'm mostly finding positives. Uh, although it makes this incident made me think, well, I got to think more about false negatives because some people have been working on removing molds and it looks to be negative now, but they're still pretty symptomatic. So then it's like, is it still mold or is it like the five or 10 other things that they have? You know, it's often pretty complex, right? Like you said, we're starting to attract the people with a lot going on. Yes, yes. And, and the truth is, it really doesn't matter whether it's a false negative or not, if you're going to use binders continuously, right? So for my personal test results, I've run it many, many times, you know, the levels will look bad, and then they look a little better, and then they look really good. And then they would look bad again. So one thing you always want to try to confirm, though, is are they colonized? And so on the organic acids test on page one, there are some markers that you can look at for fungal overgrowth, and you can sort of you know, determine, hey, are they colonized or not? Now, the difference is someone can be a mold reservoir, right? So they can just be holding on to the mycotoxins from being exposed, or they could be a mold factory, or they can be both. So you could be internally creating mycotoxins, meaning if you pack up and move to the desert like Bridget, then if you're colonized, you could still bring that mold with you in a sense and the mycotoxins. So this is why some people they'll go and do like these mold sabbaticals or these vacations in exotic places to try to get away from wherever they came from. And they don't feel much better. Part of it's just the mycotoxins in their bucket, but it could also be the colonization in their sinuses and in their gut. And so that's why we try to use herbal antifungals. I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't prescribe, but my bias is towards natural stuff anyway. So I'm going to be using uh, nasal, whether it's uh, silver hydrosol or grapefruit seed or xylitol or various antifungals up the nose. And then we're going to be using antifungals on the gut as well. And that's really what it takes to get people better. Yeah, here's a little example, uh, organic acid test. Evan, I have never once seen the colonization as, as Great Plains described it on a test result. I mean, that's super surprising. I see it yeah. almost every single day. How funny, how funny that we have like an opposite. Well, hey, I mean, that makes your, that makes your, your client population easier to deal with because when they're colonized, man, it, it's a beast. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, I don't know if this ever, I literally have never once seen it. So I just tell people, you know, let's, how can I say like, even if we don't know for, you know, we're not seeing it here, you know, if you're sick, we see your mycotoxin positive, whatever, like we always need to treat the gut really, right? Because there's that gut connection with mold, it's going to give you leaky gut, you're more susceptible for infections and candida. So well, here's the thing too. Uh -huh. here, here, here's my take on it is well, you know, even if you didn't show up with colonization, let's say we ran a stool test on you and you showed up with some sort of bacterial overgrowth. A lot of the herbs that I'm using are so broad spectrum that they're not only going to be killing the bacterial infections and the parasites, but some of those may have antifungal properties as well. Yeah. So, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So you can go ahead and use the antifungals and address it and get someone better. But yeah, I see the colonization all the time. So that's I'm so funny. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's strange. I but, do see this most of the time. So yeah, and you know the oxalates can be driven up by candida. So uh, you know there's everybody, uh, there's that one guy getting rich on making oxalates look like the devil. But in reality, I find that the diet dietary oxalates are a very very minimal part of yeah. the equation. Yeah, this is mostly a marker of candida and mold. So yeah, sometimes you have to read you know read into these tests a bit, and sometimes you're not seeing the colonization in the gut, or you're not seeing. Well, I pretty much always see the this arabinose high you know, mm -hmm. sign of candida and then a little more, you know, sign of it here um, on this part of the test. And then the rest of the test, it really depends. Like I just had a client with a lot of mitochondrial markers off, but um, sometimes not so much, even with mold, which again, that person's lucky to not be dealing with that aspect. 
Um, but it's kind of, for me, usually a crapshoot the rest of the test, but what I'm going to see. Anything you want to point out on this test, Evan? Yeah, I mean, the vitamin C, you know, we always see that low. We often see the B6 low, and you need adequate serotonin and B6 to make melatonin. So it's very common to have sleep issues. You know, with the mitochondrial damage, of course, it's going to help you identify sources of chronic fatigue. So we'll often come in with some mitochondrial support nutrients, whether it's acetyl-L-carnitine or possibly some ribose, uh, maybe some rhodiola. We can use some adaptogens to help boost up energy. If we have an adrenal test, we may look at that and see what's going on. We may use like some licorice or some eleuthero or other adrenal supports. A lot of times I'm seeing the dopamine elevated and that can happen due to gut infections. And so if you have clostridia, that messes up the uh, beta hydroxylase enzyme, you then get a buildup of dopamine. So when we see people, you know, dopamine is like a Goldilocks neurotransmitter, right? You don't want too little because you have no energy, you have no drive, you have no focus. But if you have too much dopamine, now I don't know clinically if there's any confirmation of this, but I just try to look at the client and study their personality. Most of the time, the really high dopamine people, they seem really aggressive. They're on edge. They seem like they have a short fuse. And so not all the time, but if you have a gut infection messing up your neurotransmitters, you have to fix that. So yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, it gets tricky, right? Because you have the client coming in and all they want to do is lose 20 pounds and, you know, get rid of their brain fog. But in reality, they need to heal their mitochondria. They need to balance their neurotransmitters. They need to, need to detox mycotoxins. They got to get rid of the fungal colonization. So really, you know, working clinically with people, I think the important thing is, you know, you listening as a client or a patient, you have to understand that you're going to come in with your set of important things, right? Like this is your top five priority list and we're going to listen to you. But in reality, we need to kind of teach you what you need to care about. You may come in with your priorities and I'm going to be like, yeah, I hear you. But to get to that 20 pounds weight loss, you need to heal your mitochondria so you can become a more efficient fat burner. You need to fix your low serotonin so you're not craving um, chocolate or you know, fix your endorphins so you're not crying at the drop of the hat. And then we'll kind of help get you to those goals in a roundabout way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I've been getting really into neurotransmitters lately. Never really kind of clicked with them or adaptogens until, I don't know, I don't think I told you I had a concussion in uh, October. So How'd I you really, do that? Oh, it's a stupid thing. Is it always is. I hit my head in a closet. <laughs> and you had a concussion? Yeah, a bad one. Yeah. Oh, no. What were yeah. you doing? Like bending down and then you hit the, you hit a shelf? Or? Yeah, there was like a ledge. And I, it's like, I'm a new home and I just came up and hit this ledge and yeah. So it was a good example for me, you know, and you, did you, did you fall back? Did you black out for a second or what happened? I didn't black out. I just was like, first I was like, that hurt a lot. And then about 10 minutes later, I started to feel kind of woozy and I couldn't concentrate. So I went to lay down and, um, but yeah, I really was high, high anxiety, um, you know, you know, really poor ability to think and like go to the grocery store, all these things. So I got into neurotransmitters and kind of mood adaptogens for the first time. And I think especially when you're so low, when you try something that works, you're like, whoa, that's really working. So I've been super impressed and wanting to learn more. And as I look back at my own mold history and how um, poorly I slept, how anxious I was, I would totally cry easily for a period of like a while, like a couple years, you know, I just didn't understand that that's, that's just the brain. Of course, the brain's connected to other things, but you know, when you're in a mood or, or whatever you think, well, it's just me, but it's, it's not really, it's just your brain is imbalanced. So yeah, I knew, uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. And oh, yeah. Yeah. don't do that again. But if you do that again, call me and hopefully I can help you to shorten your recovery timeline. But I knew that my endorphins were burned out when I was reading my daughter. I was reading children's books and I would just start to tear up over a book. Like it was just a cute little like kid's book and I would start to tear up. I thought, oh my God, this is pathetic. I'm about to start crying from a children's book. And then I tested my organic acids and sure enough, my endorphins were just tanked. And, you know, that happens to a lot of practitioners because, you know, we're taking on a lot of emotional and, you know, energy from our clients and it can really deplete us. So it's a very, very common thing to, to see that. Interesting. 
Okay, here's a few more markers. And again, sometimes I'll, I'll be giving glutathione or mitochondrial support, even if I don't see it off, because just the symptoms sound to be, this is a toxic exposure marker that I, I look for as well. As yeah. if that's, if that's And that's happens. not always high. Sometimes I'll see crazy yeah. high mycotoxins and that marker looks fine. So, you know, this is yeah. why we run multiple tests, right? Because sometimes you're not going to find the smoking gun just from one particular marker. That's why we like to do the whole complex of tests. Yeah, we have a package right now of three tests that doesn't include mold, but I kind of want to make a new package because I really want to always see the gut for sure, what's going on there. And then often people have hormonal issues. You know, I'll, I do think hormonal issues will even out over time, um, but also looking back at my old mold case, I think it was just a year or two ago, I found out how mold affects like that HPA and reduces, you know, causes poor hormone production. And it was just like such a light bulb that went off for me because I had these like tanked out hormones <laughs> for so long. And you think, oh, it's just stress or whatever. Kind of similar to your story in the beginning. Like there's only so much you can blame on food and stress. <laughs> like after totally. a while, you have to be like, something else is going on here. And I think I had a similar experience with like learning more and more and getting like somewhat better. And then I was like, gosh, there's got to be more to this because I still just don't feel as well as I should. Any other questions? Is this going live? Is this going live on your Women's Wellness Collaborative or where is this on Facebook? That way I can see if there's any questions or anything on there. It is on, yes, my Women's Wellness Collaborative. Page. Okay, cool. Let me see if I can. But any questions here on the webinar, guys? And I have definitely more questions for you, Evan. So don't worry about so that. So I, I know <laughs> that you you wanted to title this like something along the lines of like mold and like chemical sensitivities and Lyme. And so really the, the thing that people are looking to hear is that uh, mold and Lyme and Bartonella, for example, can trigger chemical sensitivities. And usually the mechanism is mast cell activation. So mast cells are part of your immune system and they're full of tryptase and histamine and other mediators. I think of them as like a leaky balloon, these tiny little balloons in your system. And after you get exposed to mold, they become leaky and you start leaking out histamine. And this is why so many people need and feel better when they do a low histamine diet after they've been exposed because their bucket is already so full from these leaky mast cells. And so for me, I develop you know, quite severe chemical sensitivity after getting exposed, tick bites and mold exposure. And it's slowly getting better, but man, it's a beast. And I'm, I'm not a fan. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, but you know, the nervous system gets so revved up from the toxic, you know, the toxins, the toxic exposure that you really have to work on settling your nervous system. So, so I think it's important for people to pick something, whether it's emotional freedom technique or a guided meditation or a deep tissue massage or a float tank, you know, people need to find something that they can do to really settle down. Uh, for me, I like to listen to music. I love music. So, I mean, whether it's going to be something nostalgic from my childhood or some of the oldies that my grandfather played or, or what, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to find something to really just settle my nervous system. So I think if you've got exposed to this toxin issue, you are chemically sensitive or you're distressed like everybody else, you got to find something to settle down. And for however hard you're working in your career, your business, whatever, you need to be opposing that hard hustle work with chill mode. And that's hard for me because I go, 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 go. And so I find it hard to really downshift and to just chill because I have so many things I'm doing. I'm working clinically. I'm doing the podcast, the YouTube. I'm creating a course. Uh, just launched a course. I'm creating another course. So for me, it's like I don't have time to slow down, but I know I'll burn out if I don't stop. So learn from my mistake, which is try to settle down before you get to that burnout phase, because it's much harder to pull yourself out when you're deep in there, as opposed to you start feeling the signs, your sleep is getting bad. You're maybe you're making bad diet choices. You know, the further you go off the rails, the harder it is to get back on. So if you can catch it early and start supporting yourself, taking it easy, downshifting, you're going to be better off. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think that's a lesson that's really kicked in for me you know, even in especially like this last year it is, is like the benefit of calming your body. And I've been taking these different neurotransmitters and adaptogens, like I said, and I'm like, oh my God, if I were doing these so long ago in my health journey and really just prioritizing relaxation, like I think it, it gives space for your body to heal. And sometimes people are like taking ginseng and like doing all these like uppers, so to speak, to like get energy. But I actually think if you calm the body 
then you have more of this like natural energy available to you. It's kind of my kind of theory I'm playing with now with my clients. What do you think? It seems like your dogs need GABA too. You oh need to God. give them some GABA. They're, they're just chasing. Ever since <laughs> he moved into this house that has carpet, they think it's like the funnest thing. They're like uh, getting traction off the carpet. <laughs> that's hilarious. So yeah, I mean, uh, I've been on adaptogens for like 10 years, you know, so what can I say? I mean, they're part of my daily thing, right? I do rotate through some of those. Sometimes I'm doing more stimulating, sometimes more calming. Uh, sometimes I'm playing with the the gabinergics. Sometimes I'm playing with things to help dopamine. Sometimes I'm just doing amino acids like acetyl L-carnitine to really help in terms of like brain cognitive function. So yeah, I mean, I'm playing with this stuff all the time. And I think when when you've done it a thousand times clinically, it's easier to just guess and check. So I may experiment. I may not necessarily test and then try it. I may just try it, right? Well, let me see how I do with theanine. Okay, interesting. And then how about if I mix it with a shot of passion flower? Ooh, that's fun. How about if I add a shot of motherwort and then a gram of ashwagandha and then some reishi mushroom and then some lion's mane and then some holy basil and then some fossil tidal serine and then fossil tidal choline. And then, oh, what about the liver support? And then, oh, digestive enzymes. So you see how my brain thinks. I mean, it just goes, goes, goes. And so <laughs> I, I, I try to stack these things. Uh, Kimberly asks, what is the new course you're creating? I'm creating several, but the next one, my better belly was the first one. All about what we just showed you, organic acids and stool testing and all of that. Uh, that course is closed right now, but it will reopen later. But the next course is going to be called Healthy Home Course. And I'm actually like 98% done with that. So healthy home course. I don't have like a sales page or anything yet, but uh, if you're just yeah, on my newsletter. About that in a sec. Yeah, you can sign up for Evan's newsletter, evanbrand.com. I wanted to share this brain quiz that I've been into and given my clients lately. It's Daniel Amen's brain quiz. Yeah. Is he going to try to sell you on his supplements at the end of it? 100%. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> but I really like his work. I mean, they are definitely a tight marketing machine, but you know, there's no harm in that. Um, I think his work is really great. I might do one of his courses actually for practitioners, but I'm saying I have my little afternoon pills right here. And this What's is in Lion there, Bridget? This is Lion's Mane right here. I already took my CoQ10. Uh, I have his everyday stress relief formula, which has like Rolora. I love it. Yes. Um, this has some phosphatidylcholine and serine and this, this is a brain. I've been hitting the brain formulas, you know, pretty hard in the last few months. And, you know, at first I wasn't sure it was working, but now I'm like pretty much, you know, I'm like 95% there. And I would rather just give my brain some extra loving than, you know, people get stuck actually in post-concussive concussive syndrome where they're, you know, they're still anxious. Their brain is still not working even years later. So I was like, oh, I'm sure it's like not going to be. Yeah. Like There's a lady. Uh, her name is Melissa. Uh, it's called Urban. Uh, her last name was, I believe, Hartwig. And then she got a divorce and now her like maiden name was Urban. But she's the lady who created the Whole30. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So she had a concussion. I remember seeing, I don't know, maybe a year ago at this point, I don't know if she still posts about it, but I remember her posting about how she had a concussion. I don't know the details of it. And, you know, she goes into all these different graphic details about um, maybe light sensitivity and anxiety and panic attacks and just, just crazy stuff that happened kind of a post concussion issue. And so this is a really common thing and it's kind of a, I don't want to say an undiagnosed problem, but definitely it's one of those mystery illnesses, if you will. Like if you go to your doctor, they're probably not going to say that that's true. They're going to just say, Oh, you know, put an ice pack on your head and you're done kind of thing. There was no real post care. Right. And the same thing happened for my daughter summer when she was two, uh, she pushed herself off the dining table. So she had a booster seat that was sitting in a, in a bar stool chair and pushed herself off of our table. It was so dumb. I don't even know why we had a, a, a table that was that high anyway. But anyway, she got done with her meal and she kicked herself off the table backwards, smacked her head on the floor. And it was a concussion vomiting the whole nine yards. Oh, yeah. And it was terrible. And I hate that it happened, but it did. And so I've been really, really trying hard to do as much as we can for her brain. So that's helped me personally and clinically too, to implement some of the stuff with her. And I think we've got her back probably 98%. You know, kids are young, uh, which, which is good. But one thing I wish we would have done, what we didn't do for the brain, and this could apply to maybe mold and, and chemicals and all these other issues, is progesterone. There's actually some mm -hmm. really promising studies on using progesterone. Uh, some of the clinical trials were using IV progesterone after concussion or traumatic brain injuries, uh, like major, like people that like get in the motorcycle crash and they're going to die. You know, their Glasgow coma scores like a four, like they're one step away from brain dead. 
and they did IV progesterone with these people and they made miraculous recovery. So I've been experimenting with some progesterone personally, and it, it's a game changer because it does act as sort of a gabinergic. It really does help calm the nervous system quite a bit. So you could play around with a little bit of progesterone and it does have some neuroprotective benefits, but the lion's mane too, you know, I stack them. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different things. And I, yeah, I just kind of rotate. I did do progesterone as well, especially I'm 46 and hitting my head. I definitely need some progesterone. So that was an easy sell for me. So Rebecca asks, are, are we saying that most likely we all need to take binders and detox? What's your opinion on that, Evan? If you live on the same planet I do, then yeah, <laughs> you need binders. I mean, at least a little something, right? Maybe it's a capsule of charcoal or a little bit of zeolite here and there or some chlorella. Yeah, I mean, if you ever eat out at a restaurant, you're getting exposed to pesticide and herbicide. If you ever drink tap water, you're getting exposed to countless pharmaceutical drugs, trihalomethanes, chlorines, chloramines. Uh, if you ever go outside and breathe air, you're breathing in microplastics, microparticles. They just found, they did a study uh, in the Arctic. I mean, basically plastic fibers are everywhere on this planet, even in the deepest depths of the ocean. Uh, because of clothing, primarily people are washing their fake clothing. That's why I only wear organic cotton. I wear bamboo. I wear hemp. That's another thing I'm doing. I'm working on an organic clothing line, which will be pretty cool. Wow. But uh, but be, my my goal is try to put a dent in the the plastic problem. So women that are wearing their you know hundred dollar Lululemon polyester pants, uh, their leggings, every time they wash those, you're emitting microfibers into the environment. And those are ending up in the rainwater. Those are ending up in the air. And so there's literally no way to get away from toxins on this planet, even in the remote pristine places of the planet, those are now contaminated. So yeah, I, I would say gentle binders for everyone forever, if you want to stay healthy and thrive in the 21st century. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're taking charcoal every day. Charcoal can be a little harsher, so to speak, of a binder, but yeah, you can rotate and there's tons of other detox stuff to do. You can do get a lymphatic massage. You can do your rebounder. The sauna. You can do your sauna. You know, we interviewed Connie on the summit. She's at least four times a week is kind of the regularity she likes to see because uh, it kind of trains your body to respond to the sauna. So uh, yeah, I think there's lots of good, you know, there are plastics in men's sneakers. Sure, for sure. Um, you know, usually the sole and but sneakers are pretty plastic <laughs> nowadays. I know? use, uh, my, I only wear one brand of footwear. It's Vivo Barefoot, V-I-V-O. Oh. That's the only brand of shoes I wear. I've been wearing them for years. And uh, the they're just incredible for one, because they don't have any drop to them. So there's no elevation. So it doesn't hurt your back. They're, they're what they call a zero drop shoe. They, they feel like barefoot shoes, like you have really good traction and connection with the ground, but it's not like those weird toe shoes. It's not like those. And so pretty much all winter, I've been wearing what they call a boot, but it really looks kind of fashionable. It's a, it's a shoe and it's a leather. It's got a leather sole to it and they're awesome. It's like leather and rubber. So I don't think those have plastic. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so tell us about your course coming up and people can get on your list if they're not to stay tuned in the healthy home course. Sure. Yeah. I mean, really the goal is just try to help people. It's very overwhelming to rent a house, to buy a house, to build a house. I've done all of those and I'm about to build another house. And so I'm going to be helping people, showing them my current house that I live in, uh, what we've done to it in regards to air purification. And we put in ERV systems, whole house dehumidifiers. We've talked about the different sources and types of insulation that you can use, where to get the best insulation, what's the best non-toxic uh, paint products, mineral paints versus acrylic versus no VOC paints. What about flooring? What about glues? What about underlayments? Um, what about drywall? So I go into all of that plus more EMF, how do you filter dirty electricity? What about magnetic fields? What about cell phone towers? What about routers? That's all in the healthy home course. And so that'll be out real soon. I mean, really, I'm just finishing a couple pieces on it and then I just need to launch it. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit of a perfectionist in the sense that I'm like, well, I forgot to talk about this and that and that. So I, I don't know why I'm delaying it. I, I probably should have launched it already. It's already 99% done, but I just have a few final pieces today. I was working on some of the EMF mitigation tools that you can use for your house. And then some of the different measuring tools, like this, this meter measures radio frequency, but you need this to measure magnetic fields. And then this measures dirty electricity. And then how do you mitigate it? So that's called healthy that's home awesome. course and it'll so, be uh, out. It'll be out real soon. And then the next course is going to be, well, I've got a bunch. I've got a ton in my head. 
Um, but I, I want to create an email course teaching people how to like for practitioners, you know, using email okay. to help reach more people, grow your business, your practice. And then also I'm debating doing a podcast course because a lot of people want to start podcasts. And then I'm also debating just doing like a coaching course. Like I'm going to, I'm going to call it, I don't know what I'm gonna call it yet, but something around the, the lines of growing your business as a coach, because there's a lot of clients I work with that they get so obsessed with this, that they want to make a career out of it. And so mm -hmm. I kind of coach people through how to do it. Yeah. You know, it's a great thing. Like the more people out talking about it. Fantastic. Does your home course include things about mold? It does. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mold mitigation. How do we treat it? How do you test for mold and what do you do about it? So there's actually a bonus. It's called your home oasis. And that's like a whole 45 minute presentation about all the different things I've done in regards to brands of flooring, the best brand of paints and all that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. You know, and I get, we, I, well, let me share the link in a sec here, but I'm going to teach a little bit about home detox and got some videos I already made getting into the mold questions that people ask me can get the most confusing um, because, you know, I'm not there on the premises to judge like, you know, how bad is your bathroom or, or, or whatever. So I know people have so many questions about mold remediation and home testing. So I touch on it, but I think to become a real expert on that, I'd have to stop everything I'm doing and, and just study that or maybe fly around to people's homes. It's, it's some of it I think needs to be handled locally. You're right. No, you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. And there's a, there's a place for that too, because you know, you can't just take a really bad situation and just like do some essential oils and get rid of it. Right. Sometimes there has to be cutting of drywall and encapsulating your crawl space. Right. Sometimes there's some pretty intense things that need to be done. Yeah, and it can be hard for me to, to weigh in. Uh, and I know they're big decisions. So, so uh, you know, there's Margaret Christensen's mold course covers that. We've got a couple of recordings on it too. Um, but yeah, I, I generally say like, Evan and I are, are a little stronger with the body and Evan now who knows about the home, but like we're meeting your own specific house for mold. You're gonna need to get a, a few opinions and probably get some good people locally to come take a look. It's, it's a big project. So it is, yeah. And if you have a crawl space and it's a dirt crawl space, right? You may need to encapsulate it. You may need to add duct work down there. So yeah, I mean, in some cases it gets more complex. You know, I'm not an expert at it, but I'm slowly growing and learning every time I work on my own health and issues and homes and also just working with clients. You know, I'll have people FaceTime, hey, show me what you're talking about in the crawl space, and they'll kind of do a video call with me. So yeah, I mean, it's just oh, nice. a, good for you. Yeah, you basically lost a home to mold and so did I. So, yep. you know, I can be a little biased when people say, oh, well, can I fix up my home? And I'm trying not to be so biased because I do hear some success stories of fixing up the home. Um, we, we fixed up our home to sell it, but uh, we did get rid of basically everything we own and didn't move back into the home. Uh, so that was sort of what I needed to do for my own family's health. And how much better are you now? Cause you came from Portland to Phoenix, correct? Yeah. You know, and it, it did take a while. People are, you know, when I moved here, I thought, Oh, well, I'll get better. Like it's not quite like that. Right. You have to do the long work of like rebuilding your body. I think I'm doing, you know, a lot better before I had my concussion. I had bought um, a hyperbaric oxygen just cause I still felt like my brain endurance could be better um, in the daytime. Uh, but then once I hit my head, I'm like, maybe my brain was good enough. <laughs> maybe I. So now I'm like over that. Actually, I feel like maybe it's from all the supplements. I mean, you know, I'm kind of learning like how much work is too much for me. And I don't know how much of that is because of mold versus kind of what you discussed before. I think our society tells us we should work at least 40 hours a week. And I actually don't really know if I am cut out for that. Just no, I mean, hunter gatherers, historically, they worked about 18 hours a week. So I think anywhere between 18 and 40, wherever you feel comfortable, I think that and wherever you feel sustainable, more importantly, I think is the best thing to do. Yeah, so I'm going to play with that. But you know, I think I'm a lot better. I, I don't know if I ever had mold, or, I'm sorry, Lyme or um, Bartonella. But I can tell you that I pushed out some stuff when I was doing oxygen therapy. So I don't know if it was Epstein Barr that I, I knew I had or if it was something else. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, a lot better. Like, I don't even know what percentage to say, like pretty close to a hundred. I mean, can I just eat nachos and like drink beer all day? No, that's going to make me feel horrible. Um, 
but I think most people feel horrible on that. They just don't realize, you know, there's just, I think we see mainstream people are like, oh, how come they can eat whatever? Well, don't think they feel so good, right? Like, so I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, I used to get jealous of people, right? I'd see people like eating pizza and drinking beer or whatever. And I was like, I'm kind of jealous, but I don't like alcohol, number one. Number two, pizza doesn't fill me up. I eat it and I'm like, God, that's like an appetizer. So even if it's a gluten-free, whatever, I, I still, would, I'd rather have a grass-fed steak and some pecans, so. Yeah, it's, it's not real food. I just want to show you um, this price for this summit is pretty low right now. It's 39 and then my little detox course will be offered to you if you click through. So uh, I'm excited about this little course as well. And I'd love to have some of you guys online for it. And then I still don't think we saw, oh yeah, we did see your page. So you can come get, you know, Evan's other talk more about the home, especially if you're curious about that. And then you can follow Evan at evanbrand.com. He's got a great podcast, obviously like wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much, Evan. Thanks for being on. Thanks, Bridget. It's always good to chat with you and we always have fun together. So keep up the good work. Yeah. Thanks for attending everybody. And as usual, we'll have this recording, um, on YouTube. And if you have any specific things to follow up with Evan, go to his site. Take care y'all. Bye guys. Bye-bye.